Welcome to today's webinar. We're so glad to have you here for leveraging policies and principles to make waves in healthcare. For those of you who have participated and are part of the tier one of family, we are so excited to have you back today. For those of you who are new, a little bit about tier one performance, we help organizations activate their strategies through their people. And those strategies can be talent, growth, transformation, or operational. But at the core of all of those, um, often patient experience, employee experience, the learning and uh, development piece of talent development, um, the, there is a component that is often overlooked related to policies and principles. And that's why we're super excited to, to have today's uh, facilitators of this discussion. Beam Mal is joining us as an author and the founder of AFWorks, which is the innovation center that um, previous founder of AFWorks, the innovation center within the Air Force. So he is uh, definitely familiar with the idea of um, uh, policies. And then Tasha Deitchman is also joining us as uh, with a deep history in the patient safety space. And at the root of a lot of that, um, you know, improvement in the healthcare setting is uh, rooted around how organizations deal with those principles and policies. So the, um, without any, oh, actually, I do want to go over just a couple of housekeeping uh, reminders. We will be recording today's session. So um, if you have to jump at all or anyone who's registered, we'll get that recording emailed to them afterwards. Also, if you have any questions throughout the webinar today, just drop them in the chat. We'll be having some time at the end to respond to some of those. And we know a lot of you are here with similar challenges that you are trying to solve. So we encourage you to get to know each other in the chat as well. Feel free to drop your LinkedIn profile or, um, you know, what you might want to connect with others on in the chat. And um, we hope that we can also facilitate some connections as well. So without any further ado, I'd like to introduce you to Beam and Tasha. Beam. Awesome. Thank you for that, Sarah. Happy Friday, everyone, and welcome to our gathering. For today's journey, we're gonna explore a mix of general history as well as specific healthcare policies and principles that we have seen within our team so that we can ultimately deliver to you four tools that we think can help improve performance. Uh, it'll be a mix of gravitas with research and history while at the same time having a little bit of buffoonery in there because we know from the neuroscience that a little bit of emotion, a little bit of unexpected surprise can help keep concepts within your memory. So to advance our way on, we're gonna begin by talking about trust as a metaphor, as a tool, and its potential impact. And we'll do that by way of the metaphor of intersections and roundabouts. Now, all of us have had to take our travels on the road at one time or another, and when you come to one of these stoplight intersections, you can kind of sometimes drop into the automaton mode of just, yep, waiting to see what I've got there. Uh-huh, waiting for the light, waiting, waiting. And it's almost similar to when you're driving on the road on a familiar road and it's late at night and you're just trying to get home and you wake up and you're like, wait, wait, I've been driving for 20 minutes. How did I get here? What just happened for the last 20 minutes, that, that automatic mode? Um, it can drop into us because we're so used to things and becoming so routine from a master planning policy, city planning, statewide planning. You know, these, these intersections are great. If everybody just follows the rules, we're going to be fine. No, no unique thinking, please. In contrast, we have out there the roundabout. And not every city has them in every location, but when you do approach these, a little bit different mindset here. There's not a stated rule. Every time you approach it, it's kind of new, like a new day. You don't know how much traffic is gonna be there. You have some idea what's going on, but you have to definitely be aware and you have to be making independent judgment and social coordination. So on the one hand, this looks more complex, but as we've seen from the research, the actual impact of the difference between the stoplight and the roundabout, it's like 70% 
to 90%, depending on your study, will show you that the largest amount of accidents, 70 to 90%, are occurring at the stoplight intersection area, as opposed to the roundabouts. Now, part of that from a research standpoint is because there's more stoplights around than there are roundabouts. But a different part of it suggests is that due to the automaton reflex of, well, here I am doing what I've been told to do. Don't go outside of the lines. The light turned green. I'm going green. And you get hit from the side. Not because somebody meant to be nefarious to you, but their brake line went out. And you went into automaton mode and looked straight ahead instead of always having that left-right gaze. And so you can be impacted in a negative way. So the research actually suggests, you know, that Stoplight intersections are, are not the winner for safety or injury. And from an innovation standpoint, roundabouts even work when there's power failures. So the localized example is kind of interesting from a metaphor of trust and empowering. Uh, within your organization, no need to chat about this, but just a moment of reflection. What do you experience more when you try and act, go into your daily activities? Are, are you meant to be an automaton? Or is there more room for the independent, hey, what's everybody doing on the team today? How are we gonna build out this day and today's experience so that we can travel on? If that's a localized example, let's look at a historical example of these night lights and stop lights that we see. For example, go to your favorite web browser and throw up image, North Korea, South Korea at night, and you're gonna see a very interesting and one of the rare ones, historical examples where we can compare policies, principles, and governance. Because ethically, you cannot say, all right, we're gonna divide up two populations and one group gets the placebo culture and the other group gets the creative culture. And we're gonna see how they play out. But through history and just the tragedies of leftover remnants of war, over 75 years ago, the Korean Peninsula was exactly that. War-torn country, generally the basic same amount of talent and populations on each side of the peninsula gets split in two. To the north, we have stoplights, command and control, you know, you're going to do what we say, unity of effort, the communist approach to taking care of the population. And to the south, 180 degrees different. We're going to be competitive thought and actions. It's going to be a democratic, market-driven type economy. How are they doing? Well, this picture gives us one view for sure. But if you're looking to quantify it into a number, another way that you could look at it is patents, intellectual progress, creativity. And in the year 2020 for North Korea, the North Koreans turned out four items that the U.S. Patent and Trade Office thought you know what, that, that's worthy of patent protection. They've applied for it. That's right, it's, it's there. So North Korea, four patents in 2020. In contrast, South Korea, 24,587 unique patents in 2020. So a 6,000x differential, which can rather grab your attention. And so just to be sure I'm setting up the metaphor correctly and linking it to world history. Uh, we have a quick poll that I think Katie's gonna pull up for us. And so real quickly, in your opinion, based upon these two contrasting stories, South Korea's culture is more similar to the intersection with stoplights or the roundabout without stoplights, South Korea. Five more seconds before the poll closes. And our tally is nicely dominating that people are far and away choosing that South Korea has more of that roundabout social interaction, sees the day. Uh, my understanding from the chat is that somebody accidentally hit North Korea and the intersection. So well done. We know everybody is wide awake. Good job. Uh, we will continue. So we can see directly from that image the impact of policies and the procedures and the governance. But if we take maybe a little bit higher step back and look at the principles driving that, and by principles, we get into a very big Venn diagram of overlapping words, values, norms, beliefs, customs, 
all of these ideas and mindsets that ultimately get manifested into these policies. Um, let's go back and look at North Korea and South Korea one more time for maybe our first takeaway of the day that we said we were gonna be exploring through. And that is, perhaps it's more important when we look 75 years ago, nobody would have said, uh-huh, if we set up this kind of a creative culture in South Korea, one day they're gonna be a world leader in electronics and at the global automobile industry level, right? You, you can't predict that. And so one of the tricks with creative cultures or trying to make a more innovative organization, uh, you, you're fearful because well, I don't know what's gonna come out of this. And that's true, but there are principles, innovation and creativity that they're not easy, but they're also not random. And so one of the first takeaways we hope you'll take away from this is focus on creating the right environment through your principles and policies not the specific innovation, because if you activate your people, you will find that they will be incredibly clever. And then there's always the concern, well, you know, I'm just not sure it's quite right. Uh, I'm up here in Northern Michigan, bunch of hay bale and uh, wood hole and farmers. You'll get the wisdom every day. The farmer who waits for the perfect conditions for planting is gonna go hungry. So, you know, there's never really a great time. It's just always the great time to be thinking about planting and harvesting. So with that, if we've left you a little bit confused, I'm gonna turn you over to my very wise teammate and uh, Tasha, over to you. Ooh, still muted, my friend. Thanks for the buddy check. Um, you know, one of the things we really wanted to start being able to do is translate what we just talked about with roundabouts and intersections in North Korea. And you're probably saying, great, what does this have to do with healthcare? And that's what we wanna do over these next, you know, moments today is, really start tying these back to some true stories that have happened in healthcare. So you can start looking back on the, the things you've done in your own organization and starting to kind of put the pieces together and say, yeah, like we did do something like that and kind of gain that confidence to, to help you know, continue forward. So the first story I would bring to you today is about admission documentation. So what we at an organization I was with were hearing on the front line was this is just taking too long. Um, and we heard that over, a number of years that admission documentation when that patient comes in just takes too long. There's so much to do, in fact, that in some places we were seeing that we were adding roles. So we would have an admission discharge nurse in some areas whose only job was to go through and make sure that all these questions were answered and this admission documentation was done so that that nurse who was actually caring for the patient could get back to the good work of caring for not only that patient, um, but the other patients within you know, her purview. And so one way that we started to look at this was instead of saying, you know, great, it takes too long, it is what it is, you know, here's a way that we can work around it, here's a new resource or a new role, or this just kind of is the way it is. Um, you know, we had this longstanding misconception of that. Of we couldn't change this. This, this is a mission process and it is, it is this way. But if we start looking at some tools, there's a way that we can start digging deeper into that and start asking ourselves questions. And so the first tool we would give to you today is the idea of looking for that root cause. And a way you can look at that is with the five whys. So, you know, initially you're gonna ask the question, you're probably gonna have a superficial um, rebuttal or answer. And it's easy to just kind of go with that and say, all right, sounds good. But if you start digging deeper and asking why again and again, you're gonna to get to a better um, root cause that you can actually do something with. So the first thing we were hearing is this is taking too much time. So why, why is this taking too much time? And the answer is, well, there's like 200 and some questions that I need to answer on this patient um, before their mission documentation is considered complete, okay? why are there 200 questions that we need to answer? Well, because questions keep getting added, stuff keeps growing the list and now we're up to 200 questions. Why do questions keep getting added? Well, our leaders said that we needed to ask these questions and so it got added and now we do. Okay, why do our leaders think that we need to keep asking these questions or have this question added? Our policy requires it. Okay, why does our policy require it? there might, keyword, might be a regulation. And so what um, a really diverse group did was get together and really pull each and every question um, from that admission navigator together and outlined, you know, one, is this a regulation? Two, um, do we need to know it on admission? Does the nurse actually use it 
if the nurse doesn't use it, who else uses it? And what that allowed us to do was really revamp this entire process. And what we learned was that many of the questions that we felt were required actually were not. Um, we were able to either answer those another way, or when we went back to the regulation, we figured out, well, that's not actually what the regulation is asking us anyway. Um, so we were able to reduce significantly the number of questions on that admission documentation, which then, you know, the outcomes that you look for on that are, we've now spent less time on admission documentation, which allows the nurse to really provide a better experience to our patients, not only the one that's being admitted, but the rest of her patient group, and really put that patient, um, you know, back into the focus. And so if we look at, those are the outcomes, but what was the environment, and what did we change in terms of intersections and roundabouts to be able to do that? So if you look at our initial process, um, to from intersection to roundabout, we had a process. The admission documentation was great in our mind because we could set notifications. And if you didn't do the documentation, we could fire a notification to you every day to do that documentation. Um, and we changed that. So instead of having a, a notification for every piece of documentation, we were intentional about where those notifications were. And then we had a trust in the process for some other pieces of that information that were no longer gonna be on this admission documentation list. We had thought um, that having one location for all of this was the best way to get this information done. But what we really identified was that the consumer of this information wasn't always the nurse who, who was admitting the, the patient. And so some of these questions, the nurse was asking and gathering the information. But when we asked the nurse the question, what do you do with this information? They're like, nothing. It sits here, someone else comes and looks at it later. And when that was the case, we looked at, can we defer that back to the group that's actually going to use the information so they can be the ones to collect it? Um, and then we got rid of kind of this philosophy of, if we think we need to know it, if an RCA happened, if we think asking a question on every patient could have prevented it, just throw it on the navigator or throw it on the admission documentation to really defining what the, the principles around what questions make it onto the admission documentation. And so if it, what we did was we said, you know, if it's a regulation that actually says we have to have it on admission, if it's value added to the nurse, um, and if it impacts all of our patients, those are things that we'll put on the admission documentation. Um, but if it doesn't meet one of those criteria, we really need to ask ourselves more questions about, is this a question that needs to go here or can it just go somewhere else within the documentation? And so I think what's helpful about this is if you reflect back on some of your own processes and you know, projects that you've done, can you start picking out and seeing you know, where you made these little improvements um, and really kind of applied this roundabouts and intersections philosophy or principle without even knowing that you were doing it? And the power of saying no, or is that just a historical remnant? Is that still current? Is that still relevant? This is not just healthcare, but again, we'll take out, a, uh, we'll go to a historical example, again, from the Air Force in this case. From my background, out at Edwards Air Force Base, California, the home of the right stuff and where the sound barrier was broken, the general of the base, General Eddie the Dragon Tiger, was in charge and he said, hey folks, you know, we're supposed to be the leading ed edge in test and evaluation. Uh, is there anything I can get, get out of your way? Can I, can I just help get out of your way? You know, what kind of rules can I help exempt you from? Or can we do what we'll call, we'll call it a waiver campaign. And so the dragon offered a waiver campaign for the summer and he went all in. I mean, he got t-shirts you can see on the left-hand side. Uh, in the middle, we came up with different culture visualization aids of saying, if we wanna change a culture, if we wanna emphasize certain principles, how can we do that in a way that doesn't demonize anyone in particular and yet gets our point across? So in the middle, you see our abominable no man. No, 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 right? Nobody personally gets the harm, but the message definitely gets there. It helps stick kind of like the power of a polit good political cartoon or a good piece of art, doing it at a principled cultured level. And at the end, what we found was over the summer, General Teichert called everybody back together and was like, hey folks, you sent me 96 different things where you said, was this necessary? Like, is, is this an Air Force rule? Is this a congressional rule? And 92 of them. I was able to get waived for you. And so it was so successful. They started another round, the winter of waivers, which you can see on your right-hand side, but just 
the idea that you could do some kind of a waiver campaign could be a powerful tool for you. And so to unleash people's autonomy, it's not really a question of if, but more under what circumstances and when, right? 96, 92 out of 96 waivers, but there's still a couple of, eh, we got to hold that. And so part of the when that we would speak of, a great team at tier one to do with the brainstorming and everybody was comparing their stories, but a fun one from the AFWorks innovation mission of the Air Force that I had the incredible fortune of being the startup year's leader for was, you know, innovation and creative cultures are possible, even in a global organization, even in something that's over 70 years old, like the Air Force, even in something that's 650,000 people big with bureaucracy, with congressional hearings and all of that. At the conclusion of our three startup years, AFWorks, our Air Force Innovation Unit, you can see along the left-hand side, was ranked number 16 in the world by Fast Company, out of 865 organizations that they evaluated as a best workplace for innovators. And the fun part was this was too in front of Amazon and Amazon had been a bit of a benchmark for different creative cultures. So it was nice to be able to pull that off. All sorts of data on what we did, but again, that's not the important part to take away here. The greater question is, or the greater consideration is, innovation and creativity is not easy, but it's also not random. So what are the different tools and principles that we can show you? Another tool we would like to offer is this spectrum of the when and if, because there are times when creativity, it's not the answer, it's just not. And if we look along our left-hand side of the spectrum, um, creativity is not the panacea, especially in certain environments like surgery, this is not the time when we want people suddenly, hey, doctor, I, I think I'd like to try this today. Like, no, we actually have a procedure for this and there's a reason. Combat operations, moments of high intensity, not necessarily the time when we want people going autonomous with their activities. But if we look to the right-hand side, we go back to that planting seeds and creating environments concept. And we think about the post-it note and what the leadership at 3M was able to do by saying, you know what? Lab scientists, 15% of your time, it's yours. If you come up with something useful, you know, let's, let's share in the intellectual property, the profits, all the goodness that comes out of it. Here we go. Well, the good Dr. Spencer Silver, he came up with the glue that does not stick that would then become the post-it note, Art Fry, program manager. And when they first test ran this in Denver and three other cities, eh, mediocre results. Do we do this? Second year, they tried it in Idaho and the rest is history. So always when we look back with 2020 vision, oh, of course the post-it note. No, not really. And so the same thing we've talked about, nobody could have predicted South Korea's rise. Nobody could have predicted the post-it note, but focusing in again on the environment, if versus or when versus if, and the when is when there's a low risk and you're not putting the company, the organization or the office on the line, how are there ways that you can promote the autonomy roundabout mindset that people have to offer? And so one of the ways that we have seen um, organizations both inside of and outside of healthcare be successful with creating these environments is starting small with something like an innovation unit or an innovation group. Um, and what this does or the benefit for the rest of the organization is it really kind of controls the scope of um, that experiment. So you're not putting the entire organization at risk, it's a small group. And these people who are attracted to innovation units are also generally gonna be your people who thrive um, with change and trying new processes and looking at a, a, a challenge point as an opportunity to try something new and, and come up with something great, as opposed to you know, being exhausted by those types of things. And so it really allows the rest of the organization to stay under the normal, workflows and practices. It preserves the energy um, for those staff who we hear, you know, the terms like I'm tired of the change or the initiative fatigue, right? It preserves the rest of the organization from having to feel that. And then we also know, I mean, change is a lot of work and you don't always know that what you're going to come out of it with is actually going to be 100% successful. The reality is, is that change and process is iterative. So you're going to roll something out and it won't fail. You, you'll have something that needs to be pivoted or improved upon. And these innovation units or areas give you a safe space to do that. And so you're really 
you know, getting a smaller group of people on board as opposed to the entire organization. It's easier to realign and redirect 100 people than it is 1,000 people. And that's what the, you know, safety of the innovation units really provides. And the other um, way that it helped, we can work out those kinks. And so then when you roll it out and you at scale across the rest of the organization, there might still be a small change you've got to make afterwards, but hopefully any of the big, oh shoot moments have been addressed within the innovation unit to really preserve the rest of the organization. And when it's something that you might be going, okay, there's an external force that requires something of us. We think what we're gonna do meets the intent of that. Uh, this innovation unit gives you the, the space to try that without having to redesign the entire workflow for the whole system. That's and another example. Oops, I'm sorry, my friend. Oh, no, that's okay. And I was going to say, so, you know, there's a, there's a time and a place for it, I think, both in terms of location, but also in terms of the challenge that you choose to take on. Uh, like we talked about with, you know, the high risk to low risk kind of compendium or continuum of change, not every challenge or opportunity that presents to you today is going to be the, the mountain to climb. Uh, you got to choose and have some small wins to help start kind of building that, that confidence and show that you can do it. Cool. Yeah, uh, just building on and providing additional uh, insights on AFWorks to Tasha's point. Uh, if the Air Force is 650,000 people big, the actual innovation unit that ended up getting that world ranking for the Air Force, we were 30 core people and probably 130 when you had all the part-time volunteers that joined in for 650,000. So to Tasha's point, one small unit can make a difference. Really, it can be one person that can make a difference if you have the right environment set up. Changing channels a bit, we, knew, uh, we now move on to neuro-linguistic programming, or words matter. So neuro, more the nervous system to which the brain is a major connectivity of all of that, uh, linguistic language. So for today's adventure, we hope that you please remember. Why do I offer this? Because at an individual level, we all affect the environment with something as simple as this traditional phrase, that is also sometimes substituted with, don't forget, or please don't forget. You can even be polite about it. But what's the difference at the micro level that may have macro level consequences? When you say, please don't forget, you are speaking to a person's weakness, to their failings. And you're saying, hi, person who has weakness and failings, could you please not be that with regard to what I'm about to ask you? But when you switch it around and you say, remembering and memory, you speak to somebody's positive capabilities. And so you say, hey, person with positive capabilities, could you please remember X? And so on the one hand, it sounds like a little thing, but let's look a little bit further. And Ludwig Wittgenstein, great, great uh, inspiration for this with his phrase, the limits of my language mean the limits of my world. For example, if the words film company, film history are what impacted Kodak, Imagine how Steve Sasson felt in 1975 when he kind of came up with at least one of the earliest, if not the earliest, digital cameras. It was much bigger than the current digital camera capabilities that we have on our phones, but still, he had a digital camera. He took it around to the different management bosses and the folks, and they're like, Steve, maybe you missed the history, but th this company has been built on film, lad. What are you doing? Or, don't you know, Steve, the Kodak moment is film-based? Or... Steve, what are you gonna? Are you gonna take this camera thing, combine it with a rotary phone, wait, a phone and a camera? Not possible. Oh wait, this is the 1970s, right? But imagine if the words that the leadership had used is, you know, Kodak is a memory capture business. Sure, there wasn't a Shutterfly or other web-based storage at that point in time, but just memory capture versus film company. How much did the words dictate the options of roundabout? versus automaton, yep, no, that's not film, stop, red light, move on to something else. A more modern example, when we did have the digital age upon us, Steve Jobs, I can still see myself driving home from the Air Force Academy, he used to teach at the Department of Management, the news cast comes on and it's like, uh, Apple computer will be changing its name, what? So I jump on, you can still find this too, the quote from Steve Jobs on that day in 2007. The Mac, iPod, Apple TV, iPhone. You know, only one of those is a computer, so we're changing the name. Like, think about, and this was 
pre-Kodak going bankrupt, but just the presence that Steve had where I don't want people saying, yeah, but you see what it says on the sign, Apple computer, iPhone people will turn down your funding. You know, all those different things that we either as peers or as leaders, the way our language can affect the culture that creates those principles or reinforces the principles and gets translated into policy, kind of a big thing. And so when we start talking about words matter and the way that we say things and the way that we preface things can make an impact, um, I would talk about patient care planning. So an organization I'm familiar with had moved to the electronic medical record, which in a lot of ways has been great for healthcare. Um, it helps organize, it helps standardize, um, it helps us have discrete fields so we can run reports, but it can also be limiting as well. And what had happened was within this medical record, there was a specific location that was titled the care plan or the care plan activity. And this had set staff up to the mindset and admittedly our own policy as well to say, this is this nice little pretty box called the care plan is the only place that care planning can occur is within this location. And what we found was we were getting that finding um, on surveys repeatedly, something along the lines of we didn't have a condition that they thought we should have, we didn't have a symptom address that they thought that we should have addressed, but we were continually getting this finding. And we just, for a long time, stayed in this mindset of care plan. The word care plan aligns with this tab. That's, that's where it's at, it's in this nice pretty box. But if we started um, looking and asking why again, you know, why do we keep getting this finding? Well, we were getting it because we weren't following our own policy that had the narrow language of care plan equals care plan activity. Uh, so why is our policy not being followed? Well, because some disciplines are already documenting this information somewhere else, typically in their own note which then was making the step of translating that into this nice little pretty care plan tab, um, a du duplicative step for those groups. Okay, so why if they're already documenting it somewhere else, are we having them document it here? Or why do they feel the need to document it somewhere else as well? Well, because some of those groups just needed more information um, in their note than is allowed or supported within the, the care plan section that we had identified. Okay, so then why? Well, they needed that documentation for, you know, billing or recertification purposes or some other driving factor that indicated that they truly needed a higher level of documentation. Okay, so why? Well, we didn't change it and we kept this narrow mindset because that's what our policy had always said and why would we change what on paper should have worked? So when we dug into it and we were able to, you know, kind of look at that that workflow and say, okay, if there's nothing that really requires us to have it in this nice pretty box, can we expand our language? And that's exactly what we did is we expanded the language from saying care plan equals this nice pretty little box to care planning is really the entire medical record. And what that did for our staff was help them be able to kind of pull that record together and the different pieces of it and say, you're right, that specific thing isn't included in this nice pretty box, but it is accounted for here and all the elements that you would expect to see are truly there. Um, and so that's what we did is we really put some framework around to say the, the care plan area is gonna be reflective of why that patient is here, where staff and nursing are spending their time and other elements that are already addressed somewhere else within the medical record, we're gonna defer back to those. But nursing, like we want you to know, I mean, the entire our philosophy is the entire record is that patient's plan of care. And so if you look back at kind of the intersections and roundabouts, language was a barrier to us um, in this conversation because we had set staff up with the idea that care plan equals this. Um, and by changing that, we were able to help them kind of leverage that entire record. Um, we wanted to control it. We wanted to have one location for all of this documentation to occur because we could put the elements in there and we could hard stop those elements. So what we did was we set the boundaries. These are like the, the minimal you know, principles of what we expect to be in here. And then we're gonna trust as disciplines that you're looking at the rest of your you know, documentation. And if it meets the intent and the elements of care planning, perfect, we'll take that. Um, and really just kind of open that mindset from a singular location to really leveraging that entire record and, and really comprehensively pulling that patient story together. 
So there's real power in thinking about our words. And for that reason, one of the tools we now want to shift to is thinking about how are we going to word put together the principles that we want associated with improving performance. Because on the one hand, it's, it's uh, two sides of the coin, but on different levels. Here we have two different models to help explain this, that policies are kind of the tactics that are going to affect that day-to-day -day motion, but there are principles that are driving it. So on the left-hand side, one model of performance that we have is the factors that link an organization's will. And the left-hand side offers us that this factors linking organizational will model. We all exist within an environment. Our organization responds to that environment, for example, to provide healthcare using a mission, a strategy, and then a culture. And we've been showing different ways that mindsets have affected the structure and policies that are associated with that culture that produces those principles, values, norms that we're used to seeing. Or we can investigate principles uh, using the person at the center of our mindset and the center of our organization. So on the right-hand side, we have the performance factors model. And once again, from where an individual sits, the first thing they encounter is the process, right? The process that's been laid out by policy, but a couple layers up, whether that was from prior senior leaders or people who were here that set the law before us, before we arrived to the office today, there's a culture that's been driving those processes. So we really want to get to the great, it's good to look at the tactics, but setting up the environment and the mindset is really kind of important. So from a words matter standpoint, uh, let's just look at a couple of different, um, I guess you'd call it advice principles that are out there. And we'll put a couple of pairs together real quickly. You know, on the one hand, it's not whether you win or lose, it's how you play the game. Paired with honesty is the best policy. So a little bit of behavioral insights here. What I'll ask you to do in a minute is into the chat, throw in, hey, are there any patterns between these pairings? Number two, never put off until tomorrow what you can do today. Or you snooze, you lose. And one other pair. Practice makes perfect. Measure twice, cut once. Jump it over to the chat for a minute. As you sit there and you think about these different pairs, is there anything, you know, if you were developing principles, if you were just using these three pairs, is there anything either between the pairs that you might notice or anything within the pairs? Any groupings that may be like, hmm, principles seem to be like what? What kind of characteristics do you see just naturally looking at these six principles? I am going to jump over here and just see what we've got on the chat. A thought about what might be similar or different with regard to our principles that we have. Ooh, very nice, right? Brevity, excellent. So one of the principles is you can say it the long way. It's not whether you win or lose. It's how you play the game. Or really quick, honesty is the best policy. And if we're going to use principles such as the ones we had, what, what are some of those factors? So brevity, excellent. You're winning for short in length. Um, if you're having principles, it's tricky. Somewhere between three and five. After a while, you know, they say you can only remember seven digits to the phone number. There was a reason for that. But it was also uh, infrastructure driven, but it's really hard to keep track of a lot. And if you say that our company is founded on 40 principles, you're going to have a hard time uh, holding people accountable to, to what should be driving them, right? We want to, when possible, Occam's razor, trigger with the least amount of information, critical behaviors that we're trying to pursue. And if you can make it catchy, how much the better? Rhyming always helps, right? Um, it's not whether you, how you play the game, when you lose, or, or honesty is the best policy. It's got a nice little rhyme. It helps your brain keep it together a little bit better. And ultimately, right, you kind of like some high yield, but if you think about it, it, it does actually, huh, yeah, it informs the way I might want to act because of it. So some things to think about if you're going to create principles uh, within your own organization. Now, for your consideration, Let's see if anybody has any memories of this. Can you remember from the past, perhaps a coach, a mentor, a parent, does anybody have a principle that they were taught that we can just see, take a look in the chat for comparison? To be early is to be on time. 
to be on time is to be late. Well stated. <laughs> That's you. You are now ready to come to boot camp with me again, and you would you would crush it. Nothing changes if nothing changes, right? Never walk past a mistake. You are oh, you are what you are when you're not being watched. That's. That's Plato at its finest, Ring of Ganges. Man, 3,000 years later, strive to be kind rather than to be right. Excellent. Awesome. Thank you, everybody. That's, that's really right. And it is not just practice that makes perfect, but perfect practice. Lead by example. Awesome. And garbage in, garbage out. You all are crushing it. Great. Thank you for that. So given the, the possible behavior ways of putting together our, our mind, our thoughts, our neuro-linguistic program, there's also some identity ways that you could be looking at the world. Yeah, and so when we look at um, some identity principles, this is a, an example of whole foods. And so these are principles that, I mean, help whole foods as a whole kind of align their staff on who they are. So when they go out into the world, they're presenting whole foods as whole foods. So we satisfy, delight, and nourish our customers. We practice an advanced environmental stewardship are just a couple of, you know, kind of the whole foods um, identity principles. There's also behavioral principles. So when we look at Amazon, these help um, Amazon kind of decide or put the guardrails on how they behave, right? So they're about ownership. They're obsessed with their customers. They want their teams to think big, um, you know, dive deep, deliver results. And then there's also guiding principles. So Charles Schwab has some good examples of, of that. You know, so people are most are your most important asset. Your reputation is your brand. So it doesn't matter what you what you say or what you it matters what you do. That's your brand. Um, you know, value is defined through your client's eyes. Are a couple of examples from Charles Schwab. So some steps for creating, you know, lasting principles is determine the scope of it, the domain that you want that further principle to refine. It might be across the all national tech firms or across the entire healthcare system, or it might be a very specific group, such as maybe you're just working on inpatient today, or you're just working on an innovation unit today. And there could also be, you know, the identity focus versus behavioral focus. What type of principles do you want to, you know, work on? Then we work at, you know, build the support and the rationale and then test that principle with a focus group. So if you're gonna have a principle, um, why are you having it and, and what's the support for it? And how can you see if, what that principle looks like when it plays out? Does it stick the same way to someone else that it sticks to you and mean the same thing? Um, align our recommendations for principles moving forward. Uh, so how does that work with a broader organization and how do you refine and, and um, align those principles going forward? And then develop communication materials and supporting examples. So you can't roll anything out if you don't have the communication plan behind it. And if you're going to go through the work to develop a principle, it's important to have the, the supporting rollout plan behind it. And once you've got that communication um, and examples in place to justify it, you're ready to launch it into the world and, and see the effects. So we have looked at a series of healthcare specific, but then national, historical, a range of industry companies, uh, different ways that again, creative cultures, uh, agile cultures, and they're not easy, but they're also not random. And we wanna give you uh, some summary takeaways. And you know, if you're going to practice what you preach, I, I hope our, our summaries uh, match that. So uh, I would like to offer that one thing we could have if we were speaking of principles that we should think about is just, just remember that stoplights keep our roundabout efforts away. Okay, that's kind of lame, really. If I go back and I say, is this, is this really going to be high yield? Are people going to say like, really, Bean? I mean, you just you, you and Tasha came up with that. That's the best you could offer as your number one? Not so fast, my friends. Let's look at this as a meta level. Let's go back one more time and say, well, what if I were to take the first letter from each of these principles, what might that spell? Ah, perhaps, right? It may not be the stoplight thing, but if you think South, South Korea, suddenly stoplight could be in their roundabout. I hope you remember the image, but I hope you remember how important the environment is and nothing's ever guaranteed, but there are ways to stack the odds. Number two, 
this was more Tasha's side of the house, but uh, I think she wins for brevity as well as for whimsy and rhyming. The great advisor becomes wiser, right? When you're you're around, whether it's the lunchroom or other, and somebody comes to you with a problem and they're like, hey, I'm just so frustrated. And you're like, well, why? And then keep going, right? Five, seven, nine, who knows how far to get to that root cause. But there's a gentle, nice, light-spirited way to do deeper investigation by being willing to hold to that why principle. So three, words are grand when they expand your options. Um, words that lack imagination destroy that digital camera creation. So looking at intentionality within our words and how are they shaping the mindsets and the behaviors of our staff? And is there are there ways that we can expand um, the meaning behind them or, or use better words in their place? And four, it's better to invent with a low risk experiment. Um, so then a theme throughout the day, I would say, you know, not every not every issue is going to be the one that you want to tackle today, but you can start small and then win at scale. And so with that, uh, we return to Sarah to uh, provide closing thoughts. Yeah, well, thank you for these insights. This was awesome and some great insights in the chat as well. We do have a couple of questions. So the first is how do the, uh, in quotes, hall monitors react? Were they excited to see the motion or were they frustrated to lose their ability to say no? And this was going back to this, this idea of the waivers. Uh, so I can start from a healthcare and then um, Beam, if you want to take it from, you know, specific the waiver example, mm -hmm. I would say it was about getting people together and on the same page and having the, the trust and the freedom and understanding within the powers that be that it is okay if we try this and if we're 80% positive it's going to work, then let's go for it um, and not be afraid that it might, we might have adjustments to make on the backside. And so I think having that conversation with our leadership and that transparency helped the quote unquote hall monitors to really be comfortable with moving forward with a, a process. Yeah, a uh, building right off of that, so that's really well said because 80% um, and go is kind of a creative culture mindset where you can't wait for 100% of the information. But I would say particularly for the military, uh, number one, it helped that a base commander, so the general, kind of the highest ranking person on base, and this also goes back to a book such as Cotter and Leading Change. Having senior leadership support for one of your change initiatives is kind of huge because you have an idea and then you go up one layer higher and they're like, well, why should I invest my time in this? And because sometimes you actually have to point and say, because leader number one said we should be looking at this. So when you have that opportunity, how did the hall monitors react? In this case, because hall monitor um, I guess you would say compensation or annual report, uh, performance report would be linked to, you know, we're supposed to be more innovative at the end of this fiscal year. What did you do to produce that? And if you're going to make that part of your performance report, there are all sorts of ways that senior leaders can do it. Or even if it's you and you want to take it to the next level, you can have the conversation of, yes, I fully understand what this policy says we're supposed to do, but what's the higher principle that we're supposed to be doing? Or maybe, yes, I understand this principle. And remember, if we're supposed to be doing our mission now, our mission could be more capable because of these new tools, processes, and technologies. So we could actually do the mission better if we were to change this policy. Will you please support us going together to the next level? You don't have to jump over anybody. You don't have to backdoor anybody. Um, we found that hall monitors were really uh, typically pretty darn receptive because it's like, oh, okay, that makes sense. And it's it's not a threat to my turf or my power. It's just, we want to do the mission better. So because you have mission articulation, because you know what your principles are and what your organization needs to accomplish, you can pretty, at least consistently from our side, rise up from a policy or rule and take it to the principles level and the values level of what your overall mission is. Great. So this one is actually, I think, somewhat connected, uh, this question from Terry. Do you have recommendations or is there data research that shows anything interesting regarding organizations with key individuals who repeatedly decline to participate in innovation and improvements? So while I think Beam is thinking hard on that one, I think 
I don't have data off the top of my head, but what I would say is when we start looking at behavior, we have to look backwards from that. So we have kind of a, a saying at tier one, head, heart, hands, right? So if you want me to do X, you need to understand what I think about it. And for me, what I think about it is impacted by how I feel about it. So we can listen to these individuals and start to understand how do they feel about this innovation or this change? We can help um, guide them to may explain it differently to them to help them feel differently so that they can think differently so that they can act differently. And some of that we can even help on the front end of just anticipating that you know innovation is hard, change is hard. Um, so how do we create the narrative that helps staff feel good about the change that's gonna happen? With regard to data, I believe it's more anecdotal. For example, you can get the MIT business case that you'd study at B school on Kodak and what happened and you can get that version of it. So A, it's gonna be somewhat anecdotal and then people are like, well, that's just one organization. But let's go back again to North Korea, South Korea at night. There you have a 75 year experiment of command and control that says, do what I do. I'm not open to additional ideas. Just do what I do. Unity of effort, let's go people. Or, uh, Capitalism in America is by uh, Alan Greenspan, who's the former Fed chairman for the US, along with uh, Wooldridge is another uh, economist. The other really natural experiment that we have of a war-torn society being put back together is the West Berlin, East Berlin story. And that is, you know, after World War II, again, the communists and high-end command and control who didn't really want to have variety of opinion, they have East Berlin, whereas US, UK, France are all defending West Berlin. And again, free market, competitive thought and actions. The neat thing about that experiment is that the wall comes down and we actually are able to compare West and East. And so if you uh, dig through the research, you'll find that the more creative cultures were about, particularly with regard to West Berlin, East Berlin, which again, the experiment is, Two groups of people with approximately the same amount of talent have to rebuild and start, play the experiment forward for over 40 years, and at the end of the day, competitive thought and action with innovation and creativity was judged to be three times more productive and prosperous than the East Berlin side. So um, I think you'll only get it anecdotally and in business cases, but there's also, again, those long-term historical studies like North Korea, South Korea, or West Berlin, East Berlin. Um, again and again, the creative culture wins out over the long term. And one last thought, the venture capitalists, just anecdotally, numerous ones that we bumped into for AFWorks Innovations, um, many of them have portfolios of uh, portfolios of 10 usually that they'll raise capital for. And the, the real belief is uh, I'm expecting 80% failure. If two of my 10 are winners, they're going to be big winners. And so you can't think in terms of uh, win and loss raw numbers, but more of a weighted average, because at the end of the day, two big wins typically outweighs eight low risks. Eh, we didn't think they'd all work out anyhow. So a 20% success rate can be pretty awesome. So I think that offers a fair bit of data to ponder at least. Fantastic. Well, thank you again, uh, Beam and Tasha for all of your insights. Thank you to everyone who attended today. Again, we will be sending out that recording and we're hoping to have uh, lots more webinars and events next year. So um, be sure to watch out for those. We did recently release our uh, patient experience guide. So uh, Katie, who I want to uh, give a giant thank you as well. She's behind the scenes producing today's event. She's just dropped that link in the chat. So feel free to download that. And um, we wish you all the best as you wrap out this year and hope to see you back in 2022. In the meantime, if you have any questions or want to connect on any of this, just um, shoot us a message or when we send the recording, um, we're a team behind that email. So feel free to just reply back and ask any questions you have. Thank you all. Take care, everyone.